Okay, good morning, everyone, um, and happy Friday. Um, a warm welcome to everyone um, to the Bayesian KOL lecture series uh, in the new year. My name is Matangi. Uh, I'm from University of Maryland, and I'll be moderating today's session. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome and introduce our speakers today. We have two of them. Um, Dr. Heinz Schmidley uh, is working as an executive director in the statistical methodology group at Novartis, uh, Basel, Switzerland. Since he joined the group in 2007, he has contributed to the development of innovative approaches for the design and analysis of clinical trials with the main focus on Bayesian methods. Uh, Dr. Marius Thomas, uh, he's currently working as a senior principal biostatistician in the neuroscience development unit of Novartis. So since he joined uh, Novartis, he has worked on various projects in the area of multiple sclerosis. Um, he's the main trial statistician for the complex innovative NEOS trial in children with um, multiple sclerosis. So today they will be presenting on the use of external data in randomized clinical trials. Um, so before I hand it over to our speakers, um, I would request everybody to be on mute um, before the during the presentation. And for any questions, uh, please make use of the chat feature. Um, depending upon the questions, we may pause in, in the middle of the presentation to answer them. And we'll have a, a separate Q&A session at the end of the presentation as well. Um, thank you, everyone, and please enjoy the talk. Dr. Schmidley. Yeah, thank you for the kind introduction. So as mentioned, I mean, it will be a joint presentation with my colleague Marius, who is really presenting, I think, the most interesting part uh, uh, of this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, it's on use of external data in randomized clinical trials. I will give some basic introduction essentially and then a case study that will be presented by Marius. So here the standard disclaimer. First, I would like to acknowledge a, a few colleagues with which I worked and Marius as well in, in the past years. So uh, some colleagues from Novartis, Bayard, Sebastian and Tito, and some ex-colleagues uh, uh, who were working from some time at Novartis, Sandro and Satrachit, and then also some external uh, colleagues from academia, uh, in particular, Tony O'Hagan and uh, David Spiegelhardt. Here's the outline of this presentation. So uh, for the case study, what we will use is uh, an approach for borrowing external information that we call Bayesian meta-analytic predictive approach. So I will uh, briefly explain uh, what that is and then uh, show a small case study, a relatively simple one, a randomized clinical trial in, in a disease called ankylosing spondylitis, where we we'll use historical control information then discuss a bit about robustness to prior data conflicts. And then I will hand over to Marius for a detailed discussion of a, a trial in pediatric multiple sclerosis, the NEOS trial. And then Marius will have a few conclusions uh, before we move on to the questions and answers session. Now, just uh, to be clear about the context uh, when, when we talk about borrowing strength from trial external information. I mean, the idea is that our starting point is a planned target clinical trial. In our case, uh, this will always be a randomized clinical trial comparing one or more test treatments versus a control. But in other cases, there could also be uh, other designs used, let's say a signal arm trial, uh, for example, the control information is just coming from external sources, or uh, it could be a more complex, let's say, those finding trial as well. But here in this talk, it just uh, will be a RCT. This target trial, when it's finished at the end, uh, will provide some data. And the idea would be to combine this uh, information that we get from the talk trial with some trial external information so that we uh, have a better, stronger evidence uh, for decision making. 
And when we say uh, using trial external information, this could be something that's available from uh, diverse sources. Again, in this talk, we will exclusively uh, consider only clinical trial information as sources for this uh, trial external information. So either historical or ongoing uh, clinical trials. But in other uh, settings, this could also be, let's say, some real world data, let's say from registries or from uh, other kind of uh, real world data sources. And if you're familiar with uh, approaches to borrow trial external information, there are obviously quite a lot uh, of different methodologies available. Uh, we will focus here again on uh, just uh, the basic meta-analytic predictive approach, and I will explain in a minute what that is. But there are other approaches which have uh, some similarities uh, with, uh, with the approach we will be using. So here is a quite uh, general uh, description of the meta-analytic predictive uh, map approach. So as I mentioned, we, we always have as a starting point our target trial, for example, from which we we'll get some target data and the data we will call Y star. So we usually don't have this data at the planning phase, uh, of course. Uh, and so it's missing data essentially at the planning stage, but then we will have the data when the target trial is completed. And then we will have several source data. Uh, uh, I call them Y1, Y2, 2YJ, that come from different sources, for example, from different uh, historical uh, clinical trials. Now, what we are all, of course, very familiar with is for each uh, source or target data to build statistical models. So we can build parametric statistical models that tell us uh, how the distribution of the data is given some uh, parameters theta j or theta star. Now, so far, uh, if you just have individual models for the individual sources and the target, this doesn't help with uh, borrowing information from the sources. So what we need in addition is a model that is linking the parameters of the different models for each of the source and the target. And uh, what has been introduced a very long time ago, uh, I don't know, 40, 50 years ago, when people are already thinking about how to borrow information, were really hierarchical models, and that will use that as well here. So the idea would be, uh, be to build a hierarchical or meta-analytic model that is linking the parameters. And this model typically also has some hyperparameters uh, involved. And, if you add uh, to this uh, entire model then some priors for the hyperparameters, then we can use the Bayesian approach to make inference on all the parameters of interest. In particular, we are of course here interested in the parameters related to the target data. And please note, we can uh, do this kind of uh, Bayesian inference approach, whether we know or don't know yet the target data. This is a relatively general kind of uh, description of the meta-analytic predictive approach. So I will give a, a more concrete example just so that things are not too abstract. And the first example, a really very simple one, is uh, the use of historical controls. And this is a particular trial that was done a few years ago. The disease in this case is uh, something called ankylosing spondylitis. The test treatment that we wanted to see that it works is a monoclonal antibody, secukinumab. And the endpoint is a binary one, essentially response at week six. Now, traditionally for these kind of trials, uh, proof of concept trials, one would use uh, something like a randomized clinical trial where, for example, 24 patients would be randomized to up the test treatment, and the same number of patients to placebo, and then maybe do something like Fisher's exact test. However, in this kind of disease, there were uh, eight similar historical placebo-controlled clinical trials run, so with the same population, 
the same endpoint, essentially the same design, just with different kind of test treatments. And so we have quite a lot of placebo information from these past trials. And the question is, couldn't we actually make use of this historical placebo information when we are designing and analyzing this clinical trial? So we, if you go back to this scheme that I showed you before in a general way, so what we have here, the, we have eight historical placebo control trials. So these are the eight sources. The data here that we will use is relatively simple. It's just the number of responders on placebo in the different uh, source trials. And here, the most natural thing would be to use a binomial model to describe this, uh, uh, this kind of data. The parameter of interest here, I mean, pi j in this binomial model is the uh, true response proportion. And theta j, that's the parameter we, we will use, is the logit transformed uh, uh, response proportion. We use the same binomial model also for the planned clinical trial. So we have exactly the setting that I described before. And uh, if you want to borrow strength from this historical placebo information, we will build here a, a hierarchical model to link the parameters. And in this case, yeah, it's a simple you could hierarchical model. You could call it a, a, a random effects meta-analysis model, essentially. And this model he has two parameters. So it's the mean mu and then the between trial standard deviation tall. And essentially the second one, this between trial standard deviation is somehow saying how much one can borrow uh, from the historical information. If it turns out that this between trial standard deviation is very large, then there will be very little borrowing. If it's very small, then we can borrow quite a lot from the historical data. And if you want more details, I mean, this kind of um, method was introduced quite some time ago. So David Spiegelhalter had some uh, work done on that, that. My colleague Bert Neunschwand and then a bit more recently some extensions as well. Now, how does this now look like? Uh, on the x axis, on the left hand side, you see this. Uh, uh, almost standard kind of forest plot where on the x-axis we have the placebo response rate. And we have data from this eight study and you see a point estimate and some credible intervals for each of these historical studies, which give us some information uh, uh, on the, yeah, where the placebo response rate did lie. And as I mentioned, we are using now this meta-analytic model to link the parameters. And with this model, we can make a prediction of what uh, the response rate in the new study is. So that's the pi star in the new study. Please note here at this planning stage, we don't have the data from the new study, the placebo data. So it's really a, a prediction essentially. And this prediction uh, will is essentially the prior information placebo that we will use in the new study. And we call this the map prior typically. So this looks very much like a random effect meta-analysis model, which is essentially also is. However, just uh, so that you know the difference, typically if you do a meta-analysis, you're mostly interested in the parameter mu, so the mean overall population mean. When we are using this kind of information for the placebo group in a new trial, then we are interested in the parameter theta star or pi star. So that's a difference uh, in a certain sense to the standard kind of meta-analytic approach. We are just interested in a different kind of parameter here. So how can we use that now for this uh, uh, randomized controlled trial. As I mentioned, we and showed in the last slide, we have derived now from these eight historical trials with a total of over 500 placebo patients, uh, 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 prior, we call this the map prior, and this prior usually doesn't have a, a simple closed form solution. So in this uh, 
uh, trial, which was done almost 10 years ago, uh, people used a relatively crude approximation by a beta distribution. In this case, with two parameters, 11 and 32. And if you're familiar with beta distribution, that just tells us this beta pry is worth about 43 patients. So what you also see, it's quite a considerable discounting from the more than 500 placebo patients we have in total in all the historical trial to just something worth about 43 patients. And the reason is that there is quite some heterogeneity between uh, the trials and that's uh, automatically then leads to a discounting of the historical information. So that's the pry we will use for placebo and for the test treatment, because this is the first time uh, this test treatment was uh, tried out in this uh, disease, uh, we use something uh, weakly informative. So something in this case, just for uh, a bit more than one patient. Uh, now, because we have quite a lot of placebo information from these historical uh, sources, we can use a different design than a traditional one, namely one where we still use 24 patients uh, randomized to the test treatment, but only six patients randomized to placebo because we have quite informative price to use here. And here just uh, the results of this trial. So uh, 14 of the of 23 uh, patients on, on the test treatments uh, responded while just one of six uh, placebo patients responded. So if we combine this data from the clinical trials uh, with the uh, prior information that we have, we get the posterior probability for a positive treatment effect, which is larger than 99.8%. So in this case, based on this POC trial, uh, people move directly into phase three and the results then confirmed essentially that uh, the test treatment is clearly superior to placebo. If you want to read more about this POC trial, uh, uh, there's a, a, a publication in Lancet by Baton and colleagues. Okay, so this was a first simple example of borrowing external trial information from external sources. An issue that is sometimes uh, discussed in, in the planning stage is that, okay, I mean, we carefully selected the sources of our ex external information and we think all, this, uh, all these sources are relevant. In the example I showed before, I mean, it's really the same kind of population, the same kind of trial design. So we really think of uh, thoughts that the historical inf information is uh, relevant. But still, I mean, maybe one should think it possible uh, to be mistaken following a, a statement Cromwell uh, did uh, a few uh, centuries ago. So how could one uh, incorporate such kind of ideas in, in the prior definition? One uh, approach that we, we're using here is that instead of using the map prior directly, we use a robust version of this map prior. And the robust version essentially is just a mixture of the map prior that is derived from the historical data and the vague prior. And the mixture components, the mixture weight, this value epsilon, is chosen to reflect the skepticism we have on the relevance of the historical data. So if uh, the epsilon is something small, like 10% or 20%, then we are quite confident that the historical information is relevant. If we put it perhaps to something like 50%, we are a bit more unsure whether the historical data is really relevant in the new context. So we have some uh, possibility to make different choices be, uh, based on our belief on how relevant the historical data are. Now, the good thing about using these uh, uh, mixture price, these robust price, is that they are heavy tailed. And uh, a lot of people in particular uh, have, Tony O'Hagan, have investigated these kind of heavy-tailed priors and uh, 
have shown that in cases of uh, clear prior data conflict, if you have a heavy tailed prior, uh, this prior will essentially be uh, discarded. And the paper by O'Hagan and Perici uh, uh, is just a review uh, of all these robust priors that can be used in different contexts. That's what you also use uh, typically in our historical control uh, trials. So what you see here in this graph is the solid line is, let's say, the original map prior. And if you use this uh, mixture, robust mixture prior, what essentially happens, I mean, you are downweighting to a certain degree uh, uh, the prior information and the, uh, the robust prior also has uh, heavier tails. And just to show you a bit the consequence of using uh, these kind of robust prior, I show you first an example with a conjugate prior, for example, a beta prior in this binomial case. So on the left-hand side, that would be the conjugate prior, a beta distribution, for example. And suppose we have uh, conflicting data. So the likelihood is really very different from the uh, prior, essentially. If you have such a conjugate prior, the posterior will just be placed some, somewhere in the middle. So it doesn't really make, in most cases, too much sense. That's just uh, the posterior is, in this case, essentially in conflict with the prior and the, uh, the likelihood as well. Now, what happens if instead of a conjugate prior, we use, on the left-hand side, a robust prior? So you see, I mean, the prior looks almost the same as the one before. It's just a bit slightly uh, lower peak and you can't perhaps see that, but, but it has a bit heavier tails. What happens with such a robust prior if you have conflicting likelihoods? You see now the posterior is essentially aligned essentially with the likelihood. So this means the prior information that we have, if it's in conflict, will essentially be discarded if you have a robust prior. And th there's no magic here, that's just uh, using standard Bayesian inference. Just if you have these heavy tail priors, what happens if you use the Bayesian theorem, uh, you will discard the prior information in case of conflict. Now, this may seem maybe a bit uh, complicated to implement, but actually it isn't, especially if you are using uh, our package tool that essentially was developed by a colleague of ours, Sebastian Weber, that's publicly available. It's called our best, our Bayesian evidence synthesis tools. And with this kind of tool, you can uh, go quite far in uh, using uh, the robust Bayesian meta-analytic approach in a very diverse kind of example. So it allows you to derive easily robust map price. You can also assess how much uh, 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 in number of patients this map prior is worthwhile using some new methodology developed by my colleague Bayard and colleagues. You can also evaluate some operating characteristics. And once you have then the trial data, you can also do the basin analysis. So the tool, I think, is really very easy to use uh, if you are familiar with R. Uh, there are also some vignettes. For example, the getting started with R best shows you essentially the ankylosing spondylitis uh, example with some twists. I mean, at the time, uh, when this trial was done almost 10 years ago, we didn't have yet developed this uh, robust prior approach. And we also didn't use uh, good approximations of the map prior that we get out of the, uh, out of the data. So uh, this has been improved in the meantime. And you can, so it's a bit of a sophisticated version of, of what I showed you in the slide so far. And yeah, here just to show you on the left upper corner how easy it is to really do the main analysis. So you're just entering essentially the, uh, the data uh, in this way. And you get out also various uh, graphs, like so something like forest plots. So you can also get plots for uh, looking at your uh, operating characteristics. Okay, with that, I think I'll stop 
my part of the presentation. I don't know whether there are some questions. Uh, yes, Schmid, Dr. Schmidtley, there are some questions on the chat. Uh, maybe if we can answer them before we move on to Dr. Thomas's presentation. Yes. Yes, the first one is about sharing slides. Uh, yes, I answered that. Um, unfortunately, due to some technical difficulties, we could not post the slides, but we will get to it as soon as possible. Sorry about that. Yeah, oh, so I didn't realize that you already answered that. Then the one is, are you using individual level data from external sources? I mean, in the example I showed here, this was really a summary data from publications. But uh, for example, in the, uh, in the case that Thomas, uh, Marius Thomas is showing, we will use individual patient data. In principle, you can use whatever source information you have. It could also be a mix of summary data from publications or individual patient data. So it's quite flexible what, you, what, what can be used here. So I hope that answers this question. Yes, I mean, in the, uh, the, another question was, do you require all study having the same capture of patient characteristics? I mean, in the very simple example that I used here, essentially we didn't use any uh, covariate information on the patients. Of course it could be, I mean, if you have individual patient data and have covariate information that you would like to include, then it could of course happen. Uh, that for some of the trials, you don't have all the covariate information available. Then things are getting a bit more complicated. But I mean, what we are using here essentially are meta-analytic tool, evidence synthesis tools. And they are also used in quite all other contexts for evidence synthesis. So there's quite a lot of literature of handling, for example, this kind of situation that was mentioned here of using you know, network meta-analysis, of using meta-regression methods, multivariate meta-analysis, et cetera. So if you look into literature, you can essentially use all these available methodologies for more complex situations. The only step to think, typically there will be an additional step, this prediction step that you just will have to add on top of the evidence synthesis that you're doing. And that may not be implemented in, in some of the kind of approaches yet, but usually it's quite straightforward to do that. Um, Dr. Schmidley, I received one question in the, in the order, just to, since we are following the order of, uh, we received the questions um, mm -hmm. as a direct message. So the question is, is the sample size of six in the control group large enough to evaluate the consistency of the historical control to the control in the current trial? Uh, it's, a, it's of course very small. I mean, it's maybe one of the most extreme cases where people are using really going very much down, but it's still possible. So for example, in this case, if there would have been five or six uh, responders out of the uh, six uh, placebo patients, that would be already a very clear conflict. So you, even with six patients, you have some degree of uh, checking whether things are completely, reasonable in reasonably aligned or not uh, in the actual trial we found one of the six uh, placebo patients respond that that's actually the most likely thing to happen based on the prior information we had so i mean you see one can see i would say zero one two would be very consistent three and four would be yeah, a bit borderline possibly, and five and six would already be a conflict. So even if very few uh, data, like six patients, one already can have some information on whether it's conflicting or not. Yeah, I mean, there's another question about uh, uh, for normal endpoints, whether one can derive closed forms of the map prior. No, it's not really possible in almost, in all cases, uh, one has to use Markov chain Monte Carlo methods to uh, 
evaluate essentially the, uh, the map prior. Then there's a question whether the same kind of concept could be used in Singlarm trials as well. Yes, uh, the same concepts have been used in, in some cases for Singlarm trials as well. Of course, with Singlarm trials, there's no chance of checking whether the prior is in any way consistent, would have been consistent with uh, the control information for uh, in a new trial. Yeah, then there's a question, why don't you use a better prior for the binomial proportion and about the logic transformation? I think there's a misunderstanding. Maybe I was a bit too fast. I mean, what you're using is a binomial model and logic transformation is just a transformation of the parameter. Not of, you know, we don't transfer, use a logic transformation or a normal approximation for the binomial data. It's a proper binomial model, just a parameter scale that you're using, which is different. Then there's a question about the effective sample size of the map prior in the final analysis. I mean, we used here a crude approximation in this uh, Lancer paper. We wouldn't perhaps do that anymore now. And for it, therefore, it was a better prior, so over 43 patients. So essentially, if you want to know, you know, if you have a conjugate prior, uh, the, the ESS is just this 43 patient, and it will add it up to uh, kind of the data we have. So we have six placebo patients plus 43 for, uh, from the beta uh, prior. So in total, it's uh, yeah, about 50 patients. But if you don't have, let's say, these simple beta prior, things are more complica complicated. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a, then a question on a placebo response might be strong in such a single arm study. Yes, that's true. I mean, if you use, really would use uh, just single arm studies, uh, then of course we have no chance of checking really uh, whether the data is consistent. So that's a risk. You know? In some cases, uh, especially in early phases, if people are very confident in, in the relevance of the historical data, that might be okay. In other cases, it's of course a certain risk. Uh, then there's another question, how does the model perform for endpoints with low incidence? Uh, that's a very good question. I think then one has to be a bit, I mean, in principle things work essentially the same uh, as, as mentioned, but uh, of course with low in incidents, the situation is a bit more difficult because uh, there will be relatively few information for each trial. The information is more or less uh, related to the, uh, yeah, maybe number of responders you have. I mean, one has to be more careful. Let's put it this way. In principle, the framework can be used, but it has to be a Bit more careful, especially in specifying the price for the hyperparameters. I think I've gone now through all the questions. I hope I haven't missed one. No, I think you're good, Dr. Schmidley. Okay, so I think we can now continue with Mario's or the most exciting NEOS trial. Okay, thank you, Heinz. Um, I hope you can all see my screen now. Um, yes. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, after this, um, this nice introduction by Heinz, um, what I will present now is um, a case study um, in pediatric multiple sclerosis where we used uh, these approaches um, just discussed by Heinz. 
Um, so starting off with a, with a bit of um, background, um, multiple sclerosis, if uh, as you are, many of you are probably um, aware is a, a chronic um, inflammatory disease of uh, chron chronic inflammatory neurological disease. And um, it exists in pediatric patients as well, but it is quite rare. Um, so the majority of cases start in adulthood and only three to 5% of cases start in, in childhood or adolescence. And there it's also primarily um, older uh, children, so primarily teenagers that, that have this disease and then younger children, it's, it's basically non-existent. And these, these patients uh, represent uh, a very vulnerable population um, because these children with MS typically show, show higher disease activity, um, in, especially if they're untreated. Um, uh, they, they will typically have two to three times higher relapse rates compared to adults. So relapses um, are the periods where um, the patients will have new or worsening symptoms. Um, also, these patients will start to lose um, often brain volume already from the onset of the disease. Um, so there's no true remission. And these patients tend to have worse long-term prognosis and become disabled at a younger age. Um, and there is, there is a high unmet need for, for treatment in this area. So in, in, in adult MS, we have now around 20 approved uh, disease-modifying therapies, while in pediatric patients, there's um, only one that's been approved worldwide based on a randomized control trial. So in the US and worldwide, and that's, that's um, Gelenia based on the only successful trials of our paradigms. Um, we recently had, uh, last year there was another approval with Obachu in the, in the EU only, but um, there still remains clearly a, a high, high need for new treatment options for these patients. And just some, some key facts that are important to, to further motivate the, the trial design we will discuss later. Um, so first of all, when we look at multiple sclerosis um, in, in adult and children, then we know that the biological processes involved are, are largely shared across the age span. So it's, um, it's essentially the same, same disease uh, in adults and children, but um, as I mentioned on the previous slide, we see this trend of higher relapse rates in younger patients, and then in particular in, in, uh, in uh, pediatric patients. So uh, as you can see on this figure on the left, uh, where we summarize some information from, from a bunch of studies um, in patients that were either on placebo or that were on some treatment, and especially on placebo, you can see this um, increased rate of relapses per year um, the younger the patient is, and of course, it's highest in, in the pediatric um, patients. And then uh, also the brain volume um, loss that, that is shown on the right here that, that emphasizes the, that there's no true remission for these patients and that um, there is a need for, for early um, good treatment options. And then also, not only do we have very few patients um, available, but also we do have um, a very competitive trial landscape um, where we have many trials competing for the same patient. So um, as I've mentioned, there's uh, many approved therapies in adults um, that are being tested um, in, in children or are planned to be tested, plan there are planned to be trials, and that further, um, further um, raises these feasibility issues that we have in this area with, with many trials competing for a uh, few patients. So coming then now to, to the NEOS trial. Um, so first want to give a, a quick um, summary of the trial in general before we go into the uh, Bayesian elements. So, so NEOS is, is a new um, pediatric study in MS. Um, it's a, it's a two-year double-blind triple dummy phase three study. And it aims to establish the efficacy and safety of, of two novel MS treatments. Um, so the first is, is um, ofatumumab, which is uh, under the brand, known and under the brand name Kesimta. And that is the first fully human anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody treatment for MS. And um, that has been approved worldwide in adults. And the second um, drug uh, is, is ipotimotomazant, which um, is an S1P modulator and that has also been approved worldwide in adults. So these are, these are two treatments that we're evaluate, evaluating here in the same trial in, in um, children with MS. And we're choosing to evaluate them in, in a non-inferiority design versus the active control uh, Gelenia uh, of Ingolimod, which is the um, the worldwide approved therapy and which has shown based on, on previous trials that it's highly effective in reducing relapse rates in children um, with, with an 82% reduction versus interferon beta 
uh, in the paradigm study, which was the first and um, first um, randomized clinical randomized double blind clinical trial in in pediatric MS, and we're choosing this non inferiority design here to um, to avoid the use of placebo or um, lower efficacy comparators. Um, and to, to minimize the risk of relapses to offer all um, patients in this study um, uh, treatments that, that we expect or the, that we expect to be um, um, very effective in reducing the number of relapses to um, yeah to, to uh, protect this vulnerable patient population from from uh, these relapses. And, and the primary endpoint um, is, is the annualized relapse rate. So it's the number of patient, a number of relapses a patient has per year. Uh, which is um, a fairly standard endpoint in MS, and it's it's, it's analyzed uh, via negative uh, binomial models. Uh, so effectively, that's that's count um, data that we have here. Um, yes, and um, so before I skip to the next slide already, I just um, to make it clear is that that all of these treatments that we're looking at here in this um, in this trial, um, they are Novartis treatments. So we have. Um, in-house, a lot of individual patient data available from, from um, phase C studies in adults because um, all these three treatments, they have been approved in adults. So there's, there's uh, plenty of uh, data already available in adults. And, and um, as we have the setting um, of um, pediatric MS where there's only few patients and feasibility is a, a very big concern, but we want to be as efficient as possible with a new trial. Um, we obviously want to leverage that adult data um, if we can. And we've, we, we know, um, as I mentioned before, that the disease is similar, but that we have this difference uh, in relapse rates that we need to take into um, account. So the question then is, um, can we um, extrapolate from, from adults to children in MS? Um, and we have um, some experience from previous studies. So um, in, in 2010, um, for, for the transform study, which is a, a study uh, in adult patients, um, there was a, a prediction made based on, um, based on a negative binomial model with, with adjustment for age, um, what would be the um, expected relapse rate in the um, pediatric paradigm study. And you can see these, these predictions here. And for comparison, these were the um, actual results that were then later on observed in the, in the um, paradigm study. So, um, obviously, that this matches the prediction so closely, there's a lot of luck involved. But um, clearly, this this um, was a successful proof of concept to to show that uh, you can use these um, models with adjustment for for these for age and, and possibly other key covariates to to um, extrapolate from the adult patients to the um, pediatric patients and and predict what what would be the relapse rate seen in those pediatric patients and. If we if we further extend this, um, so again we we have these three treatments where we have uh, a lot of historical trials in adults, and and we can now look at all these trials and and fit the same type of models, um, and and that is what is shown here on on the left uh, in this figure where we have uh, separately for each of these studies fit such an extrapolation model, a negative binomial model adjusting for age uh, and, and and key covariates. Um, and then extrapolate into the uh, pediatric range. Um, so, and that that is the patients from starting from year ten. Um, as I've mentioned, we only um, really have the disease in 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 all the pediatric patients. So, below the years of uh, below the age of ten, there are basically no patients, and the, the patient population that that we look at for these trials um, is ten to seventeen years. Um, so, this is why we only have to consider this range. And and what we can see. Um, from these um, individual study extrapolations that, that we see this consistent pattern um, where the relapse frequency is, is age dependent on placebo or on lower efficacy treatment options. And the curves are relatively flat for, for more effective therapies um, like Fingolimod, which is approved and then um, Ofatumab and Ziponimod show similar, similarly, similarly flat curves. So Ofatumab here um, in the Asclepius one and two studies, um, the red line and Ziponimod the green, um, the green line here for the for the bold studies, and again we have also overlaid here the actual data, the observed data from paradigms, and we can see, I mean, the transforms example, which is the one I've showed on the previous slide, but um, also these other studies. Uh, when we look at the predicted rates on Fingolimod, um, we see that this matches closely what we actually see in the 
um, pediatric data. So overall, this this paints a very consistent uh, picture and and uh, and shows us that that we we are able to accurate, accurately extrapolate um, from these adult studies to pediatric um, patients. Um, and then before we go into the the, the implementation of the Bayesian design, um, so the, the the primary analysis model that is used for um, for this study here, again, this is a negative binomial model. Um, and uh, so that's that's uh, obviously also a model that that can be used without any historical data that that is used in in, in a frequentist way, typically in many studies. Um, we just we're using um, a lock link uh, and and the, the the relapse rates or the number of relapses of a patient depend on obviously the treatment and uh, key covariates. Um, and um, what what we have available now in terms of historical data, um, from these historical studies. Um, we have the, the relapse data from, from four historical studies for the comparative Fingolimod, and three of those are in adults and one in children, uh, which can inform the, the theta zero here in this model. We have two studies for Ofatumumab and two studies for Siponimod. So these could potentially inform the theta one and the theta two, um, so the, the, the log AI in, on these treatments. And, and the historical data for each of those studies consists of um, the potentially extrapolated log ARR and the standard error estimates for each uh, of the studies. Um, and we then take all this information and use the meta-analytic predictive approach um, to prospectively define priors for the log ARR that we expect to see on these treatments in a new pediatric study. So, um, I mean, Heinz has, has already um, summarized this approach um, of course, um, so so just um, maybe to to um, show what this looks like for for this study here. So we we take all the um, historical data that we have, which which in this uh, example consists of the uh, log ARR estimates from the historical studies, um, which which we assume to um, be be normally distributed, and um, we link all of these. Um, in, in this hierarchical model uh, where we assume the relapse or the ARRs for each of the studies are exchangeable. We allow for some um, between trial um, variability as well. Um, and so these models are fit um, for each of the treatments essentially um, that we have in the study where, so we assume of course the mean is different for each of the treatments, but we assume that the between trial variability um, is the same for, for all three treatments. So that parameter is shared. Um, and then we can simply um, get the log ARR for, for a new pedi pediatric study um, by drawing from that same, same distribution and, and prospectively define um, the prior for the, for the log ARR in a, in a new study. Uh, and as, as Heinz mentioned, um, there's, the there's the option to, to further robustify these map priors um, to protect against prior data conflicts. Um, and in our situation here, um, I mean, we've seen based on the data that we have that that this extrapolation seems to be quite accurate and consistent. But obviously, um, for for of a tumor and only mode for the two test treatments here, we we have actually um, no pediatric pediatric data yet. So obviously, we want to have some protection against situations where um, the historical data and and the, the, the data in the new trial um, might not be aligned um, and. And uh, therefore, we're also using this, this robust uh, map approach um, proposed by, by Heinz, um, where we're adding the, the vague weekly informative component to, to, a, to a mixture that consists of this robust or, or this vague component and the informative part of the prior, um, and where we can choose um, the mixture way to essentially reflect our skepticism of, on the relevance of the source data. Um, and that then leads to a prior that is more heavy tailed uh, and where the uh, informative part can be um, discarded in the case of prior data conflict. Um, so this is essentially a form of dynamically borrowing then from the um, historical data. And um, what, what we are um, choosing here for the, for the um, uh, mixture wage is, is uh, 0.24 Fingolimod. And that reflects that we actually have pediatric data um, for this treatment. Um, and we have seen that the extrapolation um, definitely is very accurate for Fingolimod. And for Ofatumab and Ziponimod, we are uh, more conservative in choosing um, weights of 0.5 as these are um, the test treatments where we don't have any um, pediatric data observed yet. 
Um, and overall, then, with this, this leads to to a, a Bayesian study design with these robust um, map priors that um, efficiently incorporates the historical information um, and still um, also is is robust to to prior data conflicts. Um, and on the right, you can you can kind of see the, the the summary here of the historical data that we have in this forest plot and how that is then um, combined into map priors for the three treatments in our study. Um, that, that cover the range of variability and that is then uh, further robustified by adding the, um, the vague components on top of this um, informative part of the prior. Um, for our study here, um, with this Bayesian design, we can, um, uh, this, this, this prior information is, is worth approximately 90 patients in total. Um, and that means we can, we can um, have a study with 180 patients total instead of 270 patients. And that is that is very um, critical here for us in this setting with with so few patients available, and um, yeah, then then we can we can run an, an efficient study design. Um, we still have um, adequate power, um, and also we we see that um, that the type one error rates are are controlled or are um, are not overly inflated for for the relevant scenarios due to using these robust um, map priors. So um, this study, um, I, I, I want to go uh, then go a bit to the to the health authority interactions for this um, study design. So um, the original proposal for this study, which was a, was an OMB, so an offer two map uh, standalone study versus Fingoli mod, and that was accepted for um, FDA's complex innovative designs pilots program. Um, so that, that is a program, if you're not familiar with it, where the, the aim is to facilitate um, the use of novel innovative designs. Um, so as part of that program, we had uh, extensive discussions uh, with the FDA. And then, of course, also in, in the EU, we had uh, many discussions around this trial design, um, with the main topics there being um, not only the Bayesian design, but also the choice of the non-inferiority margin. And then of course, the, the extrapolation that is used, the, the extra accuracy of the extrapolation models, covariates to take into account. And, and of course, the Bayesian priors, where um, important topics are, of course, um, what, what is the weight that we give to the informative component of the prior? What is the, the type one error rates um, control in different scenarios? And, and one specific topic here for this trial design is also the the, the Ws that we have uh, of the historical information for the I margin and for the priors, um, because to come up with an inferiority margin, you're, you're also, of course, usually looking at um, the, the historical treatment effects um, of the comparator against uh, placebo or, or other treatments. Uh, and then you're using that those same studies potentially in the prior. Um, so that's um, something that was a bit of a concern for, for FDA initially. Um, so I think the concern there was that that might lead to some self-fulfilling prophecy scenarios, essentially where you always end up being non-inferior non somehow. But um, I think we were able to show in, in simulations that that is actually not um, the case and that this is not overly um, leading to, to false positive conclusions. Um, still, there were some um, key modifications to this study design from the one we initially proposed based on the feedback. Um, we, we received from the health authorities and based on these um, discussions we've had, um, the margin itself um, that was um, lowered from our initial proposal to a margin of two on the ratio scale instead of a three. Um, we also included an additional upper uh, limit on the analyzed relapse rate that is required on the test drugs to conclude non-inferiority. Um, so to essentially protect against scenarios where um, you would have high relapse rates in all treatments. Um, so where you might still be non-inferior to Fingoli mod in that situation, but the relapse rate might be higher than, than uh, on uh, other comparator, uh, other drugs like interferons. And that lead to some um, increased sample sizes. Um, we, we also included um, a key secondary analysis that um, compares the test treatments against historical interferon data directly. Um, so um, that, that would then be based only on the um, historical study data. Um, so that's kind of a, allows to, to have a direct comparison against interferon instead of um, Fingoli mod and show superiority against inter historical interferon data. 
Um, also, this, this um, combined study design was a result of the uh, discussions we've had, because initially, uh, as I mentioned, we had this proposal of a standalone of a two-map study and also standalone saponimod study, and those studies were then combined into one uh, design with a shared comparator arm to, to further increase the efficiency um, of the design. And also, I think uh, we uh, what is important in general for these patient designs is the inclusion of, of uh, tipping point sensitivity analysis um, that, um, that are pre-specified to, to assess how robust the conclusions from the analysis are to uh, different weights given to the prior information. Um, so, so we essentially have now um, specific, pre-specified um, sensitivity analysis where we uh, lower the weight of the historical information up to uh, essentially a fully frequentist design so that, that allows you then to assess um, how big is the um, impact of the historical information, how much historical information is needed to still come to the same uh, conclusions. And, and in the end, um, the, the final study design has been accepted um, by both FDA and also by, um, by EMA. So um, concluding here, um, in general, um, Bayesian designs um, that, that draw strengths from trials external data um, can, with this robust map approach, be scientifically robust. They are often um, more ethical than alternative design options and can minimize burden and risk to patients. Um, and by being um, more efficient, they, they allow to be feasible in, in um, situations like the pediatric MS setting where um, standard trial designs might not be an option and cannot be completed in, in a reasonable time frame. And, and um, in yours uh, specifically, um, the, the robust metanetic approach is used to robustly incorporate the historical data um, the approach we're using is, is essentially a partial extrapolation approach where, where we're using the um, data from adults, um, but we're also still um, relying on um, new pediatric data that, that we are um, generating um, from the, from by actually recruiting patients on these treatments. Um, and the, the Bayesian approach here is for us very critical to, to reduce sample size um, to a feasible level. Um, and, and complete um, the trial hopefully in, in a reasonable time frame. Uh, as I mentioned, that has been accepted this design by um, FDA and EMA, and we, we, the study is actually ongoing now. So we had um, the first patient uh, recruited in this study in October of last year. And some references, and with that, I would conclude. Um, thank you, Dr. Thomas. Um, I think we can have the question answer session now. Um, anyone would like, anybody would willing to ask a question, you can unmute yourself and you can post the question or you can use the chat um, box as well. There is one question on the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so the question is, uh, please explain how you evaluate and test the accuracy of the extrapolated model for the drugs with no data in the um, pediatric population. Um, so yeah, obviously we, we don't have pediatric data yet um, for, for these um, drugs. So we, uh, we cannot definitely say that, um, that this is exactly what we, what we will see on, on pediatric patients on these drugs, but rather the justification here is more based on the fact that um, we know that clinically, we know that the disease um, is, is similar in, in pediatric and adult patients. Um, in addition, we know that um, the patients that we're looking at, they are um, in the age range of 10 to 17 years, um, while the adult studies obviously recruit patients from the years of 18. So these populations are directly um, adjacent. So we're not extrapolating that far. And also that we see this consistent um, pattern um, in the in the historical adult studies, and when we use these extrapolation models, um, where we see across a range of treatments the same same pattern, and that further um, for us shows that that this extrapolation results is, gives us consistent and most likely accurate results. Hey, this is uh, Andrew Hartley from PPD. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, okay, great. So um, 
years ago, I first heard about uh, dynamic borrowing of evidence uh, using power priors where you raise the um, external, the, the uh, prior of the uh, external information to some power alpha where alpha uh, depends on the data. So that always um, made me uncomfortable because you're using the data twice. It seems to go against the philosophy of, uh, of Bayesian analysis. Um, but uh, from what I'm hearing from you, we can really accomplish much of the same thing using mixture priors uh, with an, a highly informative element and then a, a vague element. Um, have you found that to be true, where, where you really um, meet the objectives of um, dynamic borrowing using uh, mixture prior? Um, I don't know, Heinz, do you want to comment on that, maybe? Uh, I, can, uh, I can say something. Yes, I mean, uh, uh, this kind of uh, price that we use here are dyna dyn dynamic in the sense that, I mean, uh, if the prior is more or less consistent with the uh, uh, data, it will be uh, essentially fully borrowing, and the further part the two are, uh, the less borrowing happens. So, so it's yeah, really so, dynamic. Yeah. Right, okay, well, that, that seems to be a way to overcome my uh, resistance to the power prior approach with that uh, adaptive um, element of, uh, of alpha. Uh, so thank you for explaining that. Um, yes. Dr. Thomas, uh, just yeah. a quick uh, quick note. Um, if you can share your reference slide, and then we can go ahead with the questions. Uh, one of the one of the audience wanted to see the reference slides. Yep. Just one second. Okay. Can I still? Now I just don't see the chat anymore. So um, maybe if you can, uh, can okay. I see. let me know if there are any other questions. Uh, yes, there are. Um, there's one question about the amount of borrowing will depend on the actual study data. So if actual data conflicts with prior, the sample size would be bigger. How do you handle this uncertainty in design, sample size, re-estimation at the interim analysis? Um, well, we we can of course simulate um, the the trial um, on in a large range of of different um, scenarios, uh, and obviously then depending on on the scenario, like you say, the um, the power will be different. But um, um, yeah, for us in this case, I think we just it's it's basically based on on uh, simulations where we we look at different scenarios and see. Um, what would be the powers, power in different scenarios and um, in the scenarios that we consider to be most likely, um, essentially the power in the scenarios that we consider most likely is, is, uh, is done, uh, that the power is adequate in these scenarios. So, so this is what, uh, how, this, um, how we try to um, choose here the, the sample size. And no, we don't have uh, sample size re-estimation um, planned in, in our study. I mean, maybe it's just something to add. I mean, in this trial that uh, I think well, you, you didn't uh, discuss, there's also an unblinded interim analysis done. Yeah, that's at great. A certain time point. So, I mean, there's, uh, how should I say, so, let's say it, it would pass this, uh, this interim analysis, then uh, the trial would uh, run longer. So with recurrent event, I mean, even if you have the same kind of number of patients by running a trial longer, you gain additional information. So even if there would be some conflict, I think with uh, with uh, having a, a, a trial which runs longer, one can compensate to that, to get to uh, essentially uh, good information. Huh? Yeah, um, I, I think the next one looks like a comment. I'm not sure it's a question. Um, the comparability of pediatric and adult disease is critical and it's not easily verified. Uh, 
yeah i i mean i i i think uh yeah i, I guess that's that's of course uh um critical for using these uh, extrapolation approaches um and i think uh, in, in in ms here with with pediatric ms we have um probably a, a situation where this this extrapolation um is possible but obviously yeah this this has to be um decided on on a case by case basis if if such an approach can be can be used yeah i don't see any more questions um uh, i mean if anybody else has additional questions please unmute yourself uh, dr thomas now you can take off the slide if it's okay. yes. i think they got the message yeah. good Hi, Dr. Thomas. This is Ram Tiwari. Uh, yeah. I'm at uh, Bristol Mars Squibb. I'm uh, head of the statistical methodology group here. And uh, thanks for uh, excellent presentation. Uh, I just heard a question about the power prior. And uh, uh, I came to BMS from FDA and I led a division, division of biostatistics in the medical device side. And before that, I was in CEDAR. Uh, we have developed uh, some methods where we uh, use the comparability of the baseline covariates and the propensity score approach uh, to select the subjects from uh, say real world data. Uh, and just after that, we use the outcome data to borrow using the power per approach. Uh, here in this case, when you are dealing with the pediatric, Obviously, uh, propensity score approach probably is not the right thing to do. So, if we, and, and the reason for doing the propensity score and uh, uh, outcome free design was that FDA, uh, uh, again, the question was double use of the data. We don't want to use the uh, have the double use of data. So, uh, comparability of the uh, baseline covariates and looking at the propensity score distributions. Uh, to select the uh, real world data was meaningful uh, without looking at the outcome. So if we are not going to use any such thing about comparability of the adult versus the pediatric population, we can talk about now the propensity score, I, I wonder. And then how we else do the comparability of the adult versus pediatric without looking the outcome data? Um, yeah, I think it's a difficult question, but um, I think in in our case we we have uh, we we do actually have some some pediatric data, um, not for all treatments, um, but uh, at least for 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 fingolimod, and we do have a previous pediatric study that um, that that uh, confirms that that um, there there is that this extrapolation approach is, is probably quite accurate and, and, and we can use that data from the adults, but um, yeah, in other situations, it, it might be uh, more challenging. Yeah, so, I mean, FDA requires exchangeability. FDA, FDA also requires if you don't have full exchangeability, at least you have a partial exchangeability. Sometimes you have no exchangeability the question is then, uh, what do we do to establish the exchangeability, uh, uh, exchangeability of the pediatric to adult? Uh, you know, how do we do that? How do we go about with, without looking any outcome data? Yeah, I don't also have a good answer to, to this question. <laughs> I think it's just very difficult. Yeah. I mean, that's so uh, I think we are in many diseases, we are just struggling. I think in this multiple sclerosis case, uh, we have, as Marius mentioned, quite a lot of uh, good reasons uh, to think that it would probably work here as well. First, we, as Marius mentioned, uh, the disease are in, in a certain sense quite similar. And, and we have one uh, example where we both have adult and uh, pediatric data. So 
at least for one compound. Uh, one has seen this, and after the end of the trial, we hopefully see whether it works uh, uh, for the other compounds as well. That gives PAP additional confidence uh, that uh, that this was a reasonable approach here. But in general, I think yeah, it's really it's very disease specific, and what kind of information is available already. And without outcomes, I think it will be super difficult. Huh? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Katie John from Gas Pharmaceutical. So thank you, Dr. Thomas, for your presentation. And I'm actually not from stats, I'm from regulatory. So I have some interesting questions for you. Did you end up have to provide a SAP as part of the CID pilot program, or it was more like a follow-up um, submission? Um, that was a, a follow-up submission. So um, that was not... Um, we did not have to provide that for the CID discussions, no. Oh, that's good to know. How about in terms of regulatory agency interaction, did you go for CID first or EMA scientific bias? Because as we know, on the EU side, there's no similar pilot program for this kind of discussion. Yeah, I mean, we went for the CID um, first. And then essentially we had follow-up discussions with, um, with the scientific advice working party. Okay, thank you. Okay, I see another question. Yeah. Did you use a fixed margin or synthetic for the NNI design? Yeah, so this is a fixed margin was, was used here. Um, as I mentioned at the end for the final design, we choose a chose a non-inferiority margin of, of two. Yeah, there is one question on um, another issue is that the different COA instruments may be needed in pediatric trials versus adults. It looks like a comment perhaps. I'm actually not familiar with like the abbreviation, like maybe you could COA, what that stands for here. Maybe, I don't know, Heinz, if you know, or if you want to comment, but. No, I don't know. No. I mean, the uh, relapses are the primary endpoint, so. A clinical outcome assessment, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, in I our case, yeah, in our case, I guess we have the same, uh, the same endpoints, but yeah, potentially in other diseases might might be a problem. Um, any more questions? Yes, this is John Lowy. I'd like to make a comment. And a question. Um, I like Dr. Tuari's uh, remark because it really, with respect to the data that we don't have, because it reminds us of how difficult it is to get at uh, solutions for new products for unmet and unmet need. Um, to the speaker, I want to ask in, in, in the mix of all of the uh, data you did have, uh, what was the biologic plausibility that was motivational for having you do the studies, if that makes sense to talk about? If, if, if that's um, not understood. So you mean- uh, Was there a biology, yeah. was there a biologic uh, concept that really pushed the, 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 the research, the clinical research forward uh, or, or was it just basically therapeutic index for safety versus uh, some other uh, piece of outcome? Um, well, to be honest, I am, I'm not sure how to, how to answer that. Um, okay. I mean, I think the basic thing is that, uh, as Maurice mentioned, uh, uh, the biologic understanding is that essentially the processes are the same in children and in adults. 
plus the children we have here. I mean, they are typically older children, so quite close to the 18 plus uh, adults that we have. So I think there's a, a good, uh, there, there's very good biological and clinical reason to believe that so, so, uh, all the three drugs are working in, in children. And so thank that's... you. You relied on the correlation really between adults and children. That was strong. That's what I guess I'm hearing you say. Uh, yes, yeah. Th thank From you. From all the world, people understand. Yeah. Um, any any other questions? Mm, I don't see anything on the chat coming up. Yeah, um, this is Hai Jun. I, I just have a quick question about the, uh, your comment about the, uh, you know, you need to add a secondary uh, analysis to compare the treatment uh, versus um, uh, interferon because um, the, the design potentially could uh, claim success when actually the, um, you know, the uh, relapse rate is actually worse than the uh, interferon. Can you comment more on that? Um, well, yeah, I mean, essentially what, what um, we, we, are, we are trying to show is that, that we would be superior than, than interferons, uh, that the two test treatments would be superior in terms of efficacy uh, versus interferons. And the, the non-inferiority design versus Fingolimod is, is really just chosen to, um, to not, uh, because, because uh, on Fingolimod, the number of relapses is so much lower than the non-interferon so that we don't need to have an actual um, interferon control arm in the study. And essentially this, this secondary analysis um, just allows to um, directly then compare against the, the interferon data um, instead of having to rely on this, this indirect approach via the, the non-inferiority margin versus Fingolimod. I hope that that answers the question. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I guess so. so. Your your margin is based on the comparison to to one of the drug. Okay, I see. Thank you. Um, there's one question I received. Um, it's, uh, it's asking, from the historical data, how to select subjects who meet the inclusion exclusion criteria as the subjects in the current trial treatment group so that the treatment groups are comparable? Um... Well, I mean, what, what we, are, we are doing in our case is, is um... We, we are using the adult data, but we uh, adjust for covariates to essentially uh, reflect what, what we would expect a patient to look like in the pediatric um, population. Um, so in, in that way, we are um, accounting for, for the differences between adults and, and pediatric patients. Um, hope that answers your question. All right. Um, maybe we can wait for one more minute for anybody who would like to ask a question. Please unmute yourself. For any final questions. This has been an interesting discussion today. All right, I'm not seeing any more questions and uh, not, nothing on the chat as well. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Schmidtli and Dr. Thomas for, uh, for an excellent presentation and for patiently answering all the questions. Um, and thanks to the, all who have joined today's session. Um, thank you all and have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, thanks for attending. Yeah, thank you. 
Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.